kind, I want to introduce our next uh, speaker, Martin, who is visiting us from Berlin. He is the co-founder of Matter.io, and they're building some fantastic tools for helping researchers, especially in the DSI field. So, Martin, off to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, great to see such a great turnout. Uh, so there's been a bit of a change in, in the audience. So I just want to give a quick straw poll. Like, how many of you are scientists and researchers? Okay, great. And how many are building in Web3? And how many are building in Web2 and want to jump into Web3? Great. <laughs> awesome. Web1? <laughs> and Web... Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so today, if you were here for Josh's talk, this is going to be more of a kind of literal applied talk. So I'm going to zoom through a bit of context setting, and then I want to do live demos and all the risks that that entails, uh, just to give you kind of a hands-on feel of some of the Web3 based applications that we're building to support uh, DSI, essentially. Um, so to start off, I, don't, I, wanna, I always like to kind of zoom back out though and start with kind of the problem. Uh, so $2.4 trillion, that's the uh, amount of uh, spend globally on R&D in, in one single year in the early 2020s. It's a tripling in the spend from 2000, which even with today's crazy inflation uh, is not the, uh, not the <laughs> source of that. However, what we're experiencing uh, as a society doesn't feel to quite add up with that spend. I think uh, there's, a, there's a feeling in society right now that you know, we're facing all these existential threats from multiple different angles. And, and even though we're spending more money than we ever have before than on R&D, it's not really resulting in the societally aligned outcomes that we would really wish for in many cases. Uh, despite that, there's been amazing advancements at the same time, but I feel we could do a lot better. One of the reasons that we feel this is taking place is that the people who are trying to solve a lot of these problems are not only trying to tackle the scientific complexity, but are then put in front of them this very uphill battle of needing to deal with this bureaucratic environment, spending 50% of their time often like applying for grants, needing to play political reputation games, operating in organizations that can't efficiently reuse the knowledge that they're generating. And overall, our structures to some degree at times feel like they don't allow us to incentivize the, uh, the research that we want as a society. And the, the, re the, the problem that we feel this is tied to is that the world is essentially getting too complex for legacy coordination mechanisms. And what I mean by that is that our organizations, our institutions, were built in a time that preceded a lot of the technical capabilities that we have today. And in a way, they're almost like putting a lid on the productivity gain and the opportunities they that we have to fully realize the use of those technologies. And so what we're very much focused on is how do we create an environment where you can take all these cutting edge breakthroughs, you know, AI assisted uh, workflows and new funding methodologies and really have it be uh, release the full potential of those mechanisms. Um, and so what's really exciting and as reflected in this conference is that the solution is very much on our doorstep. When you look at the convergence of what's happening around Web3 technology, decentralization, new governance methodologies, uh, the funding that can come through that, combined with new AI capabilities that can support and raise the productivity of every individual research, and overall the access that this can provide on a global level to the information that's necessary and the toolings that's necessary, I think we're in, I'm, I'm an optimist for the future, to put it that way. Um, and I think Josh also mentioned this, and in the previous conversation, uh, in the presentation in the auditorium, what's really great about this community is that in a time where a lot can feel quite dark at times, uh, here you have a very optimistic crew, and they're very, I think the other fun thing about DSI, I think Josh mentioned this as well, is that it's a community of scientists, so there's a lot of skepticism at its core. So it means that people really need to be quite rigorous in their approaches, and I think that's also what's going to contribute to the success of this community. And so the way I like to summarize the formula of what we're working towards is really how do we empower researchers with tools that 10x plus their productivity, and then add to that a global coordination mechanism that can reward contribution and share insights as they happen, and at the same time remove the legacy bureaucracy and misaligned incentives that they lead to, to effectively give us the most efficient way to coordinate society and help us solve these challenges uh, that we're facing. And so what we're working on at lateral.io and what we're building into a new entity as well are tools and mechanisms for coordinating and funding decentralized research. So that's what I'll be demoing very shortly. Now, um, for anyone in the room that's done a lit review, this is where this all begins, which is you may not have expected this. So essentially, the, the, the reason why we've started with lit reviews is because in the research process, it's often one of the key 
points of your research is really identifying uh, what am I building on, where are the research gaps, and so on. And I think it's really an undervalued area in many ways, because from a coordination perspective, it gives a lot of opportunities for, for allowing for collaboration, for um, more efficiently retrieving uh, prior work that could help you, and also to really build this graph of the problems that we're solving and allow for interdisciplinary research around it. And so what will be what I'll be showing is how you can translate the, the static lit review process that we have today, where, which a lot of people can find quite a chore. Some people enjoy it, but many people find it a chore. And how we can translate that into a graph-based approach that eventually evolves into a global decentralized coordination graph that can both assist the researcher in identifying the information that they need and what they're building on, but also help society access that research. So a funder can see a global picture of what is going on and understand where are the bottlenecks and deploy capital more efficiently. Um, patient communities or citizen communities can actually go in and see how is the money that uh, they, for example, are paying into their state being deployed. It gives a lot more transparency. And I think Web3 allows for a UX that actually makes this quite a straightforward process. So just to give a quick overview of the two interfaces that I'll be showing. So we the, the first step of all this for us as a company, we took a journey over the past 10 years of basically how can we assist uh, large organizations and, and society as a whole in uh, finding the information they need, need leveraging machine learning. And we distilled that into an app that basically lets you read PDFs quickly um, because we found that this was a big societal need, ironically enough. Um, but this is then the gateway into how you can contribute to this global graph of evidence. So I'll be demoing that very shortly. Now, a key uh, concept that is very important for this graph uh, is the information model. And the information model is called discourse graphs. And if you hang around the DSI community long enough, you'll very quickly, I think, uh, pick up on this concept. Uh, discourse graphs are an information model developed by a professor called Joel Chan with funding from Protocol Labs. And the, the focus of it was really how do you distill the process of synthesizing knowledge uh, into the core building blocks that you could represent on a graph. So simply put, basically it means saying, what is the question? What are the claims you're making to inform that question? What is the evidence behind your claims? And what is the source of that evidence? And this super simple information model is quite nice because what it gives you is just enough structure to make collaboration more effective but not too much to make it feel like you're railroaded into one way of working. And when you, when in building this coordination graph, this gives you this interoperability in a really powerful way. So that's what I will be showing now. And so to the title of my demo, um, what I'll be aiming to show very rapidly, and I'm going quite rapid fire because I'm trying to cover quite a lot of uh, ground in a short amount of time. Um, you can also watch it back on YouTube. Uh, but the point is I'll be trying to show uh, how to accelerate research, how we can start looking at rewarding contributors, and how this can be used to align with societal needs. So without much further ado, I'll jump over to the demo. And my starting point will be then couched in the lit review world. Uh, and this is the first app that I mentioned, the lateral app. And um, what I'll be showing you is just a very short example of how that comes together. So um, the app just lets you collect different projects uh, in, diff in our dashboard here. And one of the key things that we look at is, you know, how, what can we learn from Wikipedia to inform research sharing incentive design? Wikipedia, a very large voluntary contribution uh, system that has shown itself to be quite important for society. Uh, and they've already done experiments of what type of reward mechanisms can actually help contribution. Um, and so when I open that, what you see is our project table. And the reason you see this project table is because most of you who have done a lit review might have encountered copying, pasting things from PDFs to tables, whether in Excel or, or maybe even advanced as Notion and things like that. This kind of looks to make it quite adjacent to that as a starting point for moving over to this graph way of working. So high level, I have this question I'm looking to answer. And what you see the columns here, they are two of the claims that I've discovered from the rows here, which are these documents um, that are the documents that I'm reviewing. And so the, the whole purpose here is to very quickly let me find evidence for some of these claims that I'm looking to reinforce. The lateral app, just in terms of accelerating, lets you then quickly search for a word that you know you might be looking for, see the examples of the, that word from, um, Oh, in, not in sight. I don't want to incite anything. Um, you can see the word uh, within the paragraphs from the documents that have been uploaded all at once. If you find one result that you like, you can then use machine learning to see similar results from the other documents. So it's a very straightforward way of compounding the evidence that you need uh, for the claims that you're looking at. 
And I won't dwell on this too much uh, in this presentation because the, what I want to show here is that the beauty of this, this interface is that not only is it a way to collect evidence in a table, it's essentially a synthesis in interface. And so what we can do is we can click graph and what this will essentially do is represent <coughs> that table in a discourse graph so that you see the high level question that I'm uh, trying to answer here. You can see the claims that I'm making below that and then the evidence that's supporting those claims and then where that evidence came from. And so this is the, the whole idea of this interface also from an onboarding perspective, which was mentioned by Josh as well previously, is that it takes you from a familiar place when it comes to this workflow of looking through PDFs and finding information and helps you kind of guide into this graph world and what that can open up. And so, um, so this is the transition that I'll now show you how it works because what I can then do is I can actually copy this discourse graph and jump over uh, to the global graph world. So um, what the global graph world, this is where the web three element and the DSI element of it all comes together. Uh, so what you're seeing here is uh, our graph where we have some high level questions like how do we accelerate human progress through DSI, some concepts of uh, claims around that which are quicker and better access to funding, intuitive collaboration reward interfaces, reputation and reward mechanisms that properly reward contribution, for example. And in this case, what I can then do is I can say, well, actually, I just worked on some information that was relevant to this, and I can then paste that graph into this graph, and I'll speak to what this means in a second, but here you can see I can then attach this as a relevant question to this um, claim over here. And um, what I often say when I show this interface is that it's one of the most <laughs> underwhelming interfaces you can imagine because we try to keep it very simple because what's happening behind the scenes is kind of wild. So this is running on a decentralized um, uh, graph database hosted by our good friend or, or created by our good friends at Ceramic, Arthur's over there. So if you're interested in that, talk to Arthur. And essentially what this means is that all of this information is living on a decentralized graph that is accessible to anyone. So you can build and remix and do whatever you want with this information in such a way that if you're building tools for other scientists and uh, you log in with your wallet, which is how you log into these mechanisms, it can be enriched with that data wherever you might be creating it. So it's moving to a world where rather than you moving your data from one system to another and so on, your data is attached to you and you can log into interfaces and bring it with you and enrich your experiences in this way. The other thing that happens is that, um, and I'll, I'll jump into the wallet side as well, because that, that might need some explaining, but basically because you're logged in with your wallet, you can actually also cascade uh, funding via the graph. So you can get this extremely granular and transparent way of setting bounties on this graph to say, here are problems that need solving. Uh, you have lots of ways that you can mix in reputation mechanisms and so on on top of the graph directly. And all of it is building in this decentralized environment where no one single entity is controlling all this. So this is also very important in the context of science because rather than putting all your faith in one third party, this is about how do we create a shared space where we all have a stake in this overall ecosystem that we're building. Um, so that's just to show that quick example. And the other thing I want to show is that you can also do fun things. Uh, now, as probably every, anyone who's on Twitter uh, might have seen, uh, chat GPT has blown up recently. So there's a lot of generative AI pieces coming together. And I think what the harbinger of that all is that we have this new colleague in the room, which is, are these new generative models, machine learning in general that is being developed. And what the graph lets you do is, for example, here, you can generate AI suggestions for claims of how to create an interface to facilitate decentralized research. And I'm live demoing here, so hopefully this does what it's meant to. Yeah, there we go. So these are then generative AI solutions for how to do all of this. And what you'll see is that we have included a very little icon here that says AI on it. And I think these new technologies, what they also allow us to do is create a collaborative space um, where you can clearly articulate the provenance of different information. And as anyone here who's looked at LL LLMs know, you shouldn't trust them too much yet. <laughs> and so the whole idea here is that you can start combining the, the rigor of you know, the lit, lit review process. You can weave into it generative mechanisms. You have, can have clear provenance, see, and I mean, you can add in here things like what model, what time, and in the future through the mechanisms that this community is building, you can even cascade uh, mechanisms through to those that provided the data. There's like, really this provides the roadmap for how to, as a society, fully embrace the benefits of these capabilities while at the same time holding them to account and also um, having mechanisms that reward those that have led to their creation. So I think this is what's so exciting about this transition. And I think 
it's very important to emphasize the decentralized element of this, because if you took a, you know, a more traditional software building approach, you'd always have this question of who the third party that is kind of aggregating all of this knowledge, like who are they and what is their interest? Whereas having that composable decentralized web three infrastructure layer to be the area that we operate in means that you have a lot more uh, of a di distributed governance mechanism as a result. And this is very important, I think, for the future so that it's not just two people in California controlling the future, basically. Um, and so that's that's just a run through a quick demo of how that comes together. And then I just want to show some other examples. So we're already collaborating with a bunch of different groups and coordinating with them. So the Foresight Institute run these amazing workshops. Check out Foresight Institute if you haven't, uh, where they also uh, are building a project around tech trees that I think there is a poster about that you should check out as well. Uh, but this is just an example of a graph that uh, we created as a result of one of their presentations. And so you can really start bringing together a lot of different types of information. And here there are different claims that are being built and so on. And so what we'll be doing going forward is refining how this is, um, how we can uh, most efficiently demonstrate this information from a UX perspective as well. But that just shows you one example. Um, also with uh, friends of VitaDAO, they have a project for uh, biomarkers uh, where it'll be creating a lit review for biomarkers where they have a bounty set out for that. And what we can help do is bring in basically a way to keep an eye, to, to, to coordinate around the contributions and so on that are done around that. Just to give a quick example here as well, we actually already have the ability to, as you bring contributors together, you could actually set a schedule to fund those contributors uh, with tokens from the ecosystem. So what's um, the other piece here is alongside seeing the provenance of information, you can actually also distribute funds to those that are contributed very um, uh, transparently. And importantly on that, that front, you might hear about this later on as well. So not to overload the information in this one talk, uh, but uh, in, in uh, the crypto and Web3 space, you have things like stable coins, which don't suffer maybe as much of a volatility uh, as some of the other tokens do. But I think what I'd highlight is that you could uh, distribute stable coins via this graph essentially very intuitively. Uh, but then in addition, uh, you also then have the native tokens of the different communities who could, that can also be distributed to reward for a contribution to that community. So in essence, it really gives you these multiple uh, different lenses to bring together for coordinating. And just to give you a couple more, uh, I'll give you one more example that I think is really important to highlight is also then this point of interoperability and interdisciplinary collaboration. So this is from an organization called New Atlantis, newatlantis.io. And they're working on this amazing project. So you, you have, if you check out anything in DSI, like this is one of the ones that you have to check out. And essentially what they're working on is how do we create uh, incentives to sustain uh, marine ecosystems, essentially. And what's quite cool about this is that it brings together a lot of complex topics. But the graph here gives you kind of an idea of how you can bring together the citizen understanding, the science understanding, and the economic understanding. Because high level, what they're trying to solve, or one of the things they're trying to solve is how do we capture CO2 effectively? And one of the, exam the, one of the main ways that you can do that, which is quite fun, is essentially whales. So how many people here know about the effect that whales have in CO2 capture? Okay, so every one of you needs to know this. So basically, um, so the, what whales do for CO2 capture is that it's called the whale pump, which is quite a fun name. But essentially whales have two effects. One is that through a whale's life, uh, they aggregate carbon on their body in such a way that when they pass away and they fall to the bottom of the ocean, they sequester that carbon for centuries. And it's about 33 uh, tons of CO2. But more importantly, what the whale does through its life is go up and down in the water. And I think it's nitrogen and iron that it eats and its waste product feeds phytoplankton. Phytoplankton is one of the most important organic absorbers of CO2. And so more whales, more phytoplankton, more CO2 grabbed from the air. So you might be asking yourself, why don't we have a lot more whales to you know, capture CO2? One of the things you need is an in, is a incentive structure for allowing for more whales to be uh, sustained and you need a financial facility for that. So this is one of these branches that need to be explored. I think the, um, the, the DeFi degens could have some good ideas here, uh, but also some more uh, hardcore economists can have some good ideas. So this gives them a way to attach to this graph. On the flip side, and I think for the molecular biologists, this is wild. Uh, how can the effect that the whales are having actually be verifiably be captured? Well, the phytoplankton metagenome carries almost the full information about the health and productivity of this pump. So for anyone who's been working on gut, uh, gut microbiome, the same math of that approach 
sample water from the ocean and you can actually get a high fidelity understanding of what's happening in your marine bio uh, uh, ecosystem in such a way that you can actually see the positive externalities coming from activity near that. And so what's, this is like crazy because what it means is that you essentially can attach this to those facilities like carbon credits, but the much better versions of that to then fund positive behavior on marine ecosystems and have that verifiably be captured so that we have a way to solve for, for example, the adverse effects of climate change by investing in more whales. Uh, and to give you a concrete number, uh, some of the economists who analyze this, I think it's $2.3 million per whale is the value of a whale. And also this uh, runs on land as well. It's $3.2 million per elephant. So this is just to say that rather than building crazy factories that are extracting whatever it might be or drilling and pumping back in, let's just have more whales. And uh, the point of all this is that this is in insanely complex. But the point is that with these type of graphs, you can start bringing people together all, all those different disciplines and have a path forward. So um, I think uh, I'm probably on time or over time. Uh, you're perfectly on time if we have up to one question. Okay, but then I'll, <laughs> then what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll quickly wrap up there. I'll also just give a shout out, for example, LabDAO. We, you can link through to things that they're doing. Um, and also we use this already internally to not only put the evidence out, but also coordinate what we're doing. So there's a whole next level of nodes, which is around the actions that are being taken and the status of those actions. Uh, so that's just to say how this all comes together. Um, so yeah, I think in the end, um, we now have a lot of active science missions alongside the ones I showed. The other one that's very exciting is within consciousness. If you're into consciousness, talk to Mally and Louie over there <laughs> because they uh, just raised a grant to dive into some of the ideas around consciousness and quantum effects attached to that and the discussions around that, that is really interesting as well. Um, but yeah, that's, I think I'll wrap up there for now uh, and leave this up for that one question. I'm gonna give you the question. I'm just trying to find our next speaker if she's in the room, uh, because I can't spot her. Can somebody fetch Isabel from Lavdao because she's on, yeah. Um, and in the meantime, uh, this gentleman was first, uh, depending on how late she is. Maybe is this open source and accessible by? Yeah, so, uh, so the, the, um, it's a good question. I have a short and a long answer. <laughs> so the, the short answer is that we are working towards having it as open source as possible, the elements that we're building with. The, the long answer is that we have a long history of trying to solve this problem. That means that certain elements are closed source for now, but will be... Um, working to create as collaborative an environment as possible for how we can build this together. And, and, and the other question, you know, you're, you're scanning PDFs here, right? And so do you have to sort of load those PDFs onto the server? Are there issues of copyright there? Yeah, so I think the, the on the, so two, two parts to that. So on the open access part, as much as possible in terms of using open access PDFs and so on and ensuring there's full uh, citation uh, graphs through to that. On the closed access hey, part, do we, do yeah. Want to come speak here while yeah, she's uh, changing the laptop? So we you need a chat less long. I'll leave this here for you. Uh, yeah. okay. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. No worries. Um, on the closed access part, this is obviously a, a, one of the big questions for the future of how to optimally navigate that problem. For now, within an institution or within your own PDFs, you can have a closed way of analyzing those so that it's only your um, the access, the, the content you have access to. But in the long term. I think this gives you mechanisms to both have an adjacent path to publishing that then means that there's more open access, uh, but also uh, paths to where those funding mechanisms can also cascade through that entire tree, even through to the provenance of the sources that are being used. So you, there's a lot of opportunities to find optimal ways for also the most cynical, let's say, finance people to also um, solve for their challenges. But I, I my hope is to push for more open access as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.